All right, we're going to continue. This is our last video on Chapter 13, and we're going to look at nuclear fission and nuclear fusion. Now, nuclear fission is a process by which a heavy, dense element is split into smaller elements. And nuclear fusion is the reverse. It's a process where lighter elements are fused together to make heavier elements. Now, it turns out that both of these processes, either the splitting of atoms into smaller atoms or the combining of small atoms into larger atoms, both of these processes generate energy. Okay, we're going to first look at nuclear fission. And if you remember, fission represents the splitting of an atom. And so we have our example here. We've got an atom of uranium. Now, this is uranium-235. as an atomic number of 92 and an atomic mass of 235. And what happens is you have a high-energy neutron coming in and striking the nucleus of this atom. And what happens? Well, the atom splits. And it splits into krypton and barium and then three neutrons are shot out uh, as a result of this. And so you have one neutron, in, one neutron coming in, striking the uranium atom, and it transmutes that uranium into krypton and barium, and then you have a bunch of neutrons flying off in addition. So in this slide, we want to look at this process in a little bit more detail. Now, here you have the nucleus of the uranium atom, and you have this neutron coming in and it's going to strike it. Now, remember, the nucleons, that is the protons and the neutrons in this nucleus, are all being held together by the strong force. Now, these red ones here, they're representing the protons, and they are, the protons are pushing each other apart. They're, and that's a very, very strong force, that electric force, trying to push the nucleons and the nucleus apart. Those protons are being shoved apart, but they're held together by the even stronger force. And so what comes in is this neutron comes in, and when it strikes in the middle, it causes the nucleus of that atom to deform. And it stretches out, and so some of them stretch out over here, and some of them stretch out over there. Now, remember that nuclear force gets weakened the further apart the nucleons are. So in this process, what you have is as this nucleus gets stretched out, the electric force is continuing to push these things apart, but the strong force is no longer able to hold it together. And so the atom literally gets ripped apart because of this process. And in that process, the electric force is strong enough to actually split the atom apart. And as it kind of blows itself up, it breaks into pieces, and some of those pieces are neutrons shooting out in different directions. So one of the things that can happen in this process is called a chain reaction. Now, this is a self-sustaining reaction, and the basic idea is this. The, the uranium atom here gets struck by this high-energy neutron, and it splits into pieces, and it shoots out its own neutrons. And some of those neutrons are going to strike neighboring uranium atoms. And then what's going to happen is they're going to send out their own neutrons, which strike their own neighboring atoms, which send out their neutrons, which strike their neighboring atoms. And so the, the basic idea is that you, so, for example, here at the beginning, you have this first neutron coming in. It strikes this nucleus. It splits into pieces, so there's a fragment from the fission process. And here are some neutrons that are being shot out. Well, when this guy hits a neighboring, nu a neighboring nucleus of a neighboring atom, that nucleus splits into fragments and neutrons. And then that neutron strikes another neighboring nucleus. This process goes over and over, so every time an atom gets split, it sends out some neutrons that strike neighboring atoms, which causes them to split. But then those atoms, when they split, they send out neutrons, which split the atoms of their nearest neighbors, and so on and so forth. And this process can proceed in an uncontrolled fashion um, in order to create an explosive reaction where energy, tremendous amounts of, of energy is released. Now, 
if you want to make a bomb, that's all you need. You just need to have this process go uninhibited and you'll get tremendous amounts of energy released. If instead you don't want to blow things up, but you want to just generate heat to power a power plant that might produce electricity to be delivered to somebody's homes, you want to control that. And the way they control that is they insert rods that are able to absorb some of these neutrons. And depending on how many rods you put in, you can control how fast this reaction occurs. So instead of it being explosive and blowing out, you can make it more of a sort of a slow burning process. Now, sometimes when you hear or you read about nuclear fission, you hear this concept of critical mass. So I wanted to explain what critical mass is. And it's basically the minimum amount of mass of fissionable material in a reactor or in a nuclear bomb that will sustain a chain reaction. In other words, if you only have one atom, you're not going to get much of a chain reaction. You have to have enough atoms to sustain the, ch the chain reaction and the critical mass is the smallest amount of mass that you can have that will do that. For a particular material, the critical mass can depend on its nuclear properties, its shape, its density, all kinds of things. In the atomic bombs that the United States dropped on Japan to end the Second World War, those bombs contained fissionable materials that were surrounded by explosives. And the way they set off the bomb, the way they made the nuclear reaction occur was they basically set off the explosives when the bomb was dropped and that compressed that core of fissionable material and changed its, effectively changed its critical mass so that the reaction would become self-sustaining and basically blow up. And that is what happened. Now, before we go on, we can take one of these check your understanding quizzes because I'm talking a lot about uranium-235, uranium-238, um, uranium-239. What do those numbers mean? What do those different names represent? Are they different elements? Are they different ions, different isotopes, or different nucleons? Well, I hope that you're thinking not elements, because they're all uranium, right? If they're all uranium, that's the element. So that's not changing. What is an ion? An ion is what happens when you have electrons either added or removed uh, from an atom. So it's not an ion. What's actually changing is the mass. This 235, 238, 239, those are the atomic masses. And so the number of protons is always staying the same because it's the same element. If they have different masses, that means the number of neutrons is different, and that gives us a clue that what we're talking about is different isotopes. Not nucleons, but isotopes. And just FYI, uranium-235, that's the kind that makes nuclear reactions work. That's the kind that can undergo fission. Now, if you dig up uranium from the ground, what you find is that the vast majority of it is uranium-238, and only a tiny percentage of it is uranium-235. Sometimes you hear about different countries trying to develop nuclear weapons, and they talk about they have centrifuges. Well, these centrifuges are tools to basically separate the uranium-235 from the uranium-238. And so if I dig up uranium from the ground, I need this kind, but it's kind of embedded in much, much more of that kind. So I need to be able to chemically separate them and that's what those centrifuges do. Now, the next thing that I wanna talk about is maybe the most famous equation in all of physics, uh, an equation that was discovered by Einstein, E equals mc squared. Now the E stands for energy. And the C is actually a constant value it's the speed of light. And the m is the mass. And so what this equation tells us is that energy equals the mass times the speed of light squared. Now, the speed of light is a really big number because light moves very, very fast. And when you square a really big number, you get a gigantically big number. 
And so what that tells us, this whole equation tells that energy and mass are equal to each other. They're the same thing. Mass is simply a different kind of energy. But the fact that they're related by this very, very big number tells us that for just a little tiny bit of mass, you can get a whole lot of energy. And if you want to make some mass, it takes a whole lot of energy to make just a little bit of mass. That's that equivalency. And this equation is essential for understanding why nuclear reactions generate energy. Here's the idea. So let's take, just for example, the idea of fission. We have a large, unstable nucleus, which is split into two smaller nucleuses via the process of nuclear fission, the splitting. What you find is that if you measure the masses of what you end up with, there's less mass than what you started with. So the mass of all the pieces is smaller than the, mes than the mass of the total. So where did that missing mass go? Well, it went into energy. That mass got converted into energy. Now, even though the difference in mass is very tiny, that very tiny mass difference is multiplied by this gigantically large value c squared. And so that means you get quite a bit of bang for your buck. You release a lot of energy in a nuclear reaction. And of course, it's not just happening with one atom. It's going to be happening with like Avogadro's number of atoms. It's a huge amount of energy that can be released. And similarly, when you have fusion, where you take lighter elements and you combine them together and you make a much bigger element, well, what you end up with has less mass than what you started with. This is the process of fusion, where two things are fused together. And again, energy is released in that process because what you end up with has, with has less mass than what you started with. Now, we can explore some of the features of this equation because it's not just about nuclear uh, fusion and fission reactions. It tells you a lot about the nucleus of the atoms themselves. For example, we can tell that the more energy there is associated with a particle, the more mass it will have. And if we're talking about a nucleon, the mass of a nucleon outside the nucleus is larger than the mass of the same nucleus bound inside the nucleus. So if a neutron is ejected out of a nucleus of an atom, that neutron is going to have more mass than the nucleon inside the atom. And the other thing that it tells us, the greater mass of the nucleon is evident by the energy required to pull the nucleons apart from one another. In other words, the nucleons in the nucleus of an atom are bound together. It takes some energy to bind them together. And when you pull the nucleus apart, that energy uh, comes back in the form of a larger mass. So this slide, the bullet point here is reiterating what I said previously. When nucleons lose mass in a nuclear reaction, the loss of mass delta m is multiplied by the square of the speed of light and that gives us the amount of energy released in that reaction. So energy is equal to the change in mass times the speed of light squared. That symbol delta, you might remember, means change in very often in mathematics. Now, the mass difference is related to the binding energy of the nucleus, which is how much energy is required to dissemble the nucleus. So here's an interesting plot that we can suss out if we plot the amount of nuclear mass, that's the mass of the nucleus, versus the atomic number, we find that it's increasing. So the higher the atomic number, the higher the nuclear mass. In other words, this upward slope with increasing atomic number tells us that elements are more massive as atomic numbers increase. Now, it's slightly curved, because of disproportionately more neutrons, the more massive atoms. So as I get higher and higher atomic numbers, those elements with higher atomic numbers can hold on extra neutrons. And that creates, rather than it being just a straight line, you can see it's kind of curved a little bit. Um, 
That's not really a detail you have to worry about, but yeah, I thought it was worth mentioning. Now, this next graph is actually a much more interesting graph. And instead of uh, plotting the mass, the atomic mass versus the atomic number, we're plotting, I don't know if you can see this, but this is the mass per nucleon. And the way you get that is you divide the mass of the nucleus by the number of nucleons. That's the number of protons and neutrons. And that gives you the mass per nucleon. And what you can see is that when you start at hydrogen and you go up the periodic table, you find that the mass per nucleon sh sharply decreases until you get to iron. And iron is very special. And we'll talk about that later, why iron is special in that regard. But once you get to iron, then you can see that the mass per nucleon actually starts increasing again, but, but not as sharply. But there's this rapid fall in the mass per nucleon. In other words, if you take something like hydrogen, which would be at the very top, and something like oxygen, which would be a little bit lower, the mass of all the neutrons and protons in the oxygen atom are smaller than the mass of the proton in the hydrogen atom. And so the higher you go in atomic number, you get the mass per nucleon decreases until you get to iron. And this bullet point here, it says the greatest mass per nucleon occurs for hydrogen because it has no binding energy to pull its mass down. That is, hydrogen is just one proton and one electron. So there's no extra protons that it has to bind with to decrease its mass per nucleon. Now, here we can see that uh, graph blown up so we can see it a little bit better. So we start with hydrogen, where you see hydrogen has the largest mass per nucleon, and then it decreases to iron, which has the lowest number of mass per nucleon. That is, the, a neutron in a piece of iron is smaller than the neutron in, say, uh, nitrogen or, or some other element that has an atomic number below iron. Now, once you get past iron on the periodic table and you go up to higher elements, you can find that the mass per nucleon is increasing. And this graph goes from hydrogen all the way up the periodic table to uranium. So it covers quite a few elements along that curve showing that trend. Okay, now this is that same graph, but it's showing us uh, something that might be a little bit confusing. So I want to try to explain it. So let's consider uranium-235 that undergoes a fission and it breaks in half and it splits into barium and it splits into krypton. And we've already talked about that reaction. And so if we look at uranium-235, every neutron and every proton has a certain amount of mass. When you look at the other pieces, the neutrons and the protons in them have less mass. And so the numbers of all the neutrons and protons, if you add them up, they're going to be the same. You have the ones that are ejected, and you have the ones that make up the new nuclei. But when you add up all the masses of all the neutrons and protons, they're less here because the mass per nucleon when you're here at, say, krypton is much less than the mass per nucleon in uranium. So that's why these guys have less mass than the original uranium. And of course, where did that mass go? Well, in the process of fission, that mass gets converted into energy via this relationship that was discovered by Einstein, E equals mc squared. Now let's take the opposite process of fusion, where you take two hydrogen, two nuclei, that's a hydrogen with a neutron, it's a different isotope of hydrogen. So you've got two hydrogen nuclei where you've got a proton and a neutron that makes one hydrogen atom, another proton and a neutron that makes a second hydrogen atom, and you look at the mass per nucleon that the two individual hydrogen atoms have, it's higher. You can see up this red curve, it's more, more mass up here. But if you convert them into helium, you have the same number of protons and neutrons, but the mass for each one is lower. You can see on the red curve, it tells you, so the mass that you have in a helium nucleus is less than the mass that you have from the two hydrogen atoms that made it. And so 
Where did that mass go in that process? It goes into energy. And so that's why both fission and fusion reactions are able to generate energy. Now to recap, we are talking about nuclear fusion now. Nuclear fusion is the combination of the nuclei of light atoms to form a heavier nuclei, and this process creates a release of energy. Any nuclear transformation that moves nucle nuclei toward iron releases energy. But if you remember, iron was the one at the bottom of that curve. It was the sort of the nuclear sink for energy production. In other words, if you try to fuse things together that are heavier than iron, you don't get energy out, you have to take extra energy in. So in this process of nuclear fusion, we can say that nuclear fusion is produced by high temperatures resulting in more tightly bound nuclei. The mass decreases as the energy is released. This is analogous to chemical combustion requiring a high temperature where the end result is energy release in a tightly bound molecule. A solution is still being sought for reactions to con occur under controlled conditions to provide an enormous amount of sustained energy. In other words, we don't yet have the ability to control the nuclear fusion process. Now, nuclear fusion is actually what produces the energy in stars like our sun. You have, our sun is basically a giant ball of hydrogen and at the center of the sun, the temperatures and the pressures are so great that the hydrogen atoms are pushed together and forced to combine into helium. And as we've talked about, that releases energy, and that's in particular what powers the energy of the sun. But that's caused because the sun is so massive, it's got so much matter in it, that its gravity is strong enough to pull these atoms together and force them to fuse. If we want to force things to fuse together on Earth, where we don't have all that gravity and all that mass assisting us, we have to overcome the repulsion of the protons in the nuclei of the atoms. So if I've got two protons and I want to get them to fuse, I have to push them together, but they're repelling each other like hell. And so it takes a huge amount of energy to push them together. Now, right now, we can do this on Earth. We can create fusion, but it takes so much energy to push these guys together that it actually takes more energy to make the fusion happen than you get from the fusion reaction. What people have been working on for 50 years or more is coming up with, the, coming up with a way so that we can cause hydrogen to fuse into helium, but do it in a way so that it doesn't take more energy to make it happen than you get out of it. Once you can do that, you're going to have essentially limitless clean energy. You've heard of green energy before. This is the greenest of the green. And so scientists have been working, scientists and engineers have been working on this problem for decades. And even recently, there's been a lot of progress on these fronts. So it is hoped that within our lifetimes that commercially viable fusion might be a way of producing energy for the people of the earth. And that, that would change so many things economically and socio sociologically and politically in every way because we would be able to end our dependence on oil. We would be able to curb in greenhouse gas emissions. And essentially, energy would become very, very cheap and it could be used to fund many things in our economy. So it's something that people have been working on in a long time. And we hope that uh, it'll be something that we'll be able to see someday, that, that nuclear fusion will be able to provide us with energy. But this problem of getting these guys to fuse is a very difficult engineering challenge. So whether it'll happen tomorrow or in 10 years or 100 years, no one really can say. But uh, we can say that tremendous progress has been made. We're closer and closer to it every day. And there is a hope of many people that this will be something that can happen. So in any case, that seems like a good place to end this part of the lecture. So we will continue next time.